Boston with you all to tell you my true story. I suppose I should start at the beginning. I was born December 17, 1760 in Middleborough, Massachusetts. I'm the oldest of seven children, my mother to raise all on her own, after my father failed to return from sea. My mother struggled to take care of us all, and although she loved us, she finally decided to us away to become indentured servants. So, when I was seven, I went to work for Duke Jeremiah Thomas and his ten beloved sons. I had household duties, such as cooking, doing the laundry, and sewing. I also had to milk the cows, feed the pigs, tend the chickens, and help plow the fields. Those are the responsibilities of an indentured servant. I learned them and did them well, but as a servant and almost like a slave, I had very few rights. I did get to go to school in the winter and tell the three oldest boys how to read. Then they went to school in the summer. Uh, I remember like it was yesterday. School started at 6.30 in the morning and lasted about two and a half hours. When the boys would come home, I would constantly ask them what they had done that day. They must have thought I was insane, wanting to go to boring school, wanting to learn everything they had to learn. But I was just so curious with everything in life. When I was about, well, let's see, 19, my servitude ended and I became what I'd always wanted to be. A teacher. It was fun for about two years, but it was much different from my life as an indentured servant. I worked 10 hours a day. I had to take care of the lamps, clean the chimneys, make the pens, and get the water. I didn't want to have the same responsibilities I had had since I was seven. I wanted to see new adventures, have a better life, with more rights. Men certainly had more rights and choices than women, so I was going to take advantage of that by dressing as a man and enlisting in the United States Army. I knew it was a far-fetched idea, but I was going to try it anyway. I would get to see people and places. I would get to see people and places I would have never seen if I were a teacher for the rest of my life. It was going to be a great adventure, but what I didn't realize at the time was that I was taking on serious responsibilities, and some of those would be very hard indeed. The next day, I went into town to see if anyone could recognize me. To my amazement, no one even questioned why I, Deborah Sampson, was dressed as a man. They even called me Sir. That night, I knew I was going to be able to make this work. After another week of teaching, I resigned my position as school teacher, leaving, be leaving behind my rights and responsibilities as a woman. I signed up to be part of the 4th Massachusetts Regiment, signed my name as Robert Shirtliff, and gained 60 pounds. The last battle of the war had ended, but some of the tourists were not ready to give up. That's where we came in. We had to stop them from causing any further damage. I must have been somewhat skillful because I managed to stay alive, but I was pretty bad at hand-to-hand -hand combat, also known as skirmishes. In one instance, the troop and I found a cavern filled with food and supplies that the Tories were keeping for British soldiers. While we were moving it, some of the Tories' garden supplies found us out. I knew we weren't going to win this battle, so I took all I could, hopped on my horse, and we took off. It was, the wind was whipping my face, and it started to snow. It was freezing cold, but we just kept going. I hear some Tories behind me on their horses. I heard a gunshot and felt a pain in my neck. Warm, warm, gooey blood rolled down my back. Again, I felt I heard a gunshot and felt immense pain in my upper thigh. By this point, my vision was blotched with red spots, and I could feel myself, my body, slowly start to fall off the horse and onto the snowy ground. I could hear the toy stop a few feet away, but assuming I was dead, it took off in another direction. I blacked out and woke up in an army hospital with the doctor looking at the wound in my neck. He then asked if I had any other wounds. I knew, of course, I had one in my leg. But if I let him take the bullet out, he would find that I was not a man. I told him no, and said I was extremely thirsty. I asked for some water. After he left, I crawled out that hospital door and onto the snowy grass outside. There was enough light from the moon that I could see where I'd been shot. With all the strength and courage I could muster, I pulled out my pocket knife and stabbed it into my leg, searching for the musket ball. It took a few minutes, but it felt like hours. I finally found it and ripped it out of my thigh. I remember there's blood everywhere. I dragged my body back into the hospital and laid down. It took a few weeks to keep everything to heal. But when I was ready, I jumped back into action. I was chosen as one of the many soldiers to defend the Congress in Philadelphia. While reporting for duty there, one of, the, one of my friend's soldiers grew very ill. Everyone was ready to leave him to die, but he knew what it felt like to be left for dead. And I could not put this poor man through that. This was a responsibility I could not neglect. Well, everyone continued 
your journey. I helped this man to near, I helped this soldier to a nearby home where we asked to stay. The older gentleman, a British sympathizer, refused. But with a little persuasion, he let us stay in the cold attic of his home. Day by day, I saw this soldier die a painful, excruciating death. And at those times, the times I had nightmares about, I realized that taking on men's, res men's responsibilities and going to war was not at all as much fun as I once thought it would be. Being responsible for other people's lives and even watching them die weighed heavily on me. Finally, this brave soldier passed away, and I was left to, with the responsibility to bury his body in the neighboring forest. I finished my journey to Philadelphia to the delight and astonishment of the soldiers who had already arrived. There, I contracted a terrible fever and grew so weak that one night I became unconscious and had to be carried to a nearby hospital, where I fell into a coma. The doctor that looked me over, Dr. Barnabas Beatty, found that I, an almost dead soldier boy, was actually an almost dead soldier girl. He and his wife nursed me back to health, all the while keeping my famous secret. When I was fully healed, I went back to my regiment in New York, and there, General Henry Knox discharged me, Robert Shirtliff, at West Point on October 25th, 1783. When my, my, so my responsibilities as a soldier ended, I went to Massachusetts to visit my aunt, Alice Walters. Still dressed as a man, she instantly assumed I was my brother, Ephraim, who had actually died in the war a long time ago. When I finally told her who I was, she gladly let me in, and she gladly let me in and told me I could stay for as long as I wished. It was a few weeks after I started dressing like a woman again that I met my future husband, Benjamin Vignette. We were soon married April 7th, 1785. Benjamin and I had three beautiful children, Earl, Mary, and Patience. We also adopted a child, Susanna Shepherd. Although I had very few, I had fewer rights as a woman, I had a lot of the responsibilities I had in motherhood and in family life. I am grateful for the experiences I had when I chose to do few things. I chose to do something few women would even consider. It was hard and rewards few, but I learned much, and I am proud of my service. With help from hard beer, I gained a pension of 34 pounds. I still have the letter he wrote and brought it to share with you today. It reads, <clears throat> Sir, Miss Deborah Gannett of Sharon informs me that she has enclosed to your care a petition of Congress in favor of her. Humanity and justice oblige me to say that every person with whom I have conversed about her, and it is not a few, speak of her as a woman of hands and talents, good morals, a dutiful wife, and affectionate parent. She is now much out of health. She has a husband who is a good sort of man, and they have few acres of poor land which they cultivate. She told me she had no doubt that her ill health is in consequence of her being exposed when she did a soldier's duty, and that while in the army she was wounded. I formed the idea of a tall, masculine female who had a small share of understanding, without education, and one of the meanest of her sex. When I saw a discourse with her, I was agreeably surprised to find a small, effeminate, and conversable woman whose education entitled her to a better situation in life. I think her case much more deserving than hundreds of whom Congress has been generous. I am sir, with esteem and respect, your humble, your humble servant, Paul Revere. I wanted to share my experiences with, every, with you, with everyone, which is why I became a public speaker and why I am here today. The war was violent, and although at the time it seemed like a great adventure, I slowly and painfully realized that war is no game. It is full of hurt, not only physical, but emotional. While I left my women's responsibilities behind in Massachusetts, I took on the heavy burden of men's responsibilities in the war. My family coat of arms stands for disgrace is worse than death. In indentured servitude, in teaching, in the military, and as a mother, I feel I have done my duty. I have fulfilled my responsibilities and exercised my rights as much as I was able. I have faced death and not disgraced myself. Perhaps that's all any of us can do. Then may we all become heroes and heroines of our 